Yeah, welcome back. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dong Sun and uh, Xiang Jensen Gray. Mm -hmm. uh, both are strategic cloud engineer at Google and uh, sharing the about loading geospatial data to Google BigQuery. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm Dong Fan. Uh, so today, me and Xiang are going to talk through uh, loading geospatial data to Google BigQuery. So we will cover a few things. First of all, uh, a general intro of geospatial data and why we need to load them into BigQuery. And the way we explored to load them into the BigQuery, um, two ways we did, and each one handles different challenges and how Beam and Dataflow helps in the whole process. We'll um, have a little, little kind of demo on the geospatial analysis with the sample data, and we'll end this session with some Q&A. So let's get started. So first of all, what is the geospatial data? As a like map user, we all know that uh, geospatial data, you know, represent the real world, anything with a location um, on the Earth, and um, it it offers a very powerful tool for us to understand the world around us. Because if we if we think like we handle the world in a three D or four D way, right? Anything in the space um, that has a location could be represented in the geospatial data. And once we have the geospatial data, it, the analysis of it can help um, organizations to make so much more um, better decisions um, because we, we have an in-depth uh, analysis of the special relationships between different features. And a lot of the industry use cases could be enabled once we have the geospatial data. Um, for example, in the traditional geographic information system world, like all the utility companies, real estate companies, any company that has any asset um, point of interest, um, the electricity infrastructure lines, etc., they have been applying geospatial data analysis. And now um, with this more data migrating to cloud, um, we, we could do more bigger scale, low latency analysis. I'll give you an example of an insurance industry use case. Say, for example, I have a house sitting on a parcel, but the parcel is part of the land that will experience these different kind of climate risks. So insurance com company can use this specific location data and provide very customized kind of um, claim procedure or policy just to fit um, for you. Um, another example, like um, infrastructure or sustainability, right? Anything like the facility sits on Earth somewhere and how we uh, analyze the climate data to make sure that previously, now, in the future, all the sustain sustainability is is there. So it, it, it seems like um, that m maybe anything that has a, a, a physical location, even if it wouldn't normally have geospatial data mm -hmm. attached to it, that you could add it in into, into BQ. And so you might have like a warehouse, for instance, and they might just have like labels for things. Um, but it could also have a geospatial component, so you could know where it is in a warehouse. Or at some later time, somebody wanted to do some sort of analysis they weren't anticipating. Uh, you can have it for free in BQ and then be able to do that later. Is that correct? Exactly, Xiang. You hit a very good point. A lot of traditional business attribute data, actually it has an address or lifelong information in there. We just need to enable it. Very uh, less work, but the impact of enabling with this geospatial information, um, it's, um, it's huge, potentially huge. And now we move on to um, why we need to load the geospatial data into the BigQuery. Uh, first of all, BigQuery, it's such a powerful and reliable data warehouse. 
and it gives you truly, truly low latency and large scale um, capability. Um, the PM team did analysis like how how well BigQuery geospatial analysis do co compared to other components. And BigQuery has lots of advantages, especially the data set is big, like petabyte, petabytes, or um, the query, the spatial query, the relationships among different features are quite complex. BigQuery just like win right then. And... Um, through the exploration, we discovered that regardless of the geospatial data types, um, there is always a way that we can help you to ingest, store, and analyze your geospatial data on GCP. Um, and once the data is loaded into the BigQuery, it's naturally integrated with other data that's available on the cloud, right? Other uh, cloud SQL, um, GCS, and um, everything. And because um, BigQuery, you know, it's a big component in the GCP offerings, it um, enables all the upper stream and downstream kind of analysis. For example, you can apply the AI ML models to your data through there. All the logging monitoring information is there by given. So BigQuery offers a lot of the special functions. Um, here we listed some of the mostly used ones, but uh, this list of special function is still growing. The capability on the BigQuery special side is still growing. But as you can see, ST contains um, like two geometry data data types. Uh, one contains within another uh, intersects. Uh, do a distance calculation. ST area calculation. So all popular um, ones and easy to use powerful ones. And, and these functions can, um, for people not used to uh, GIS, these are standardized across a lot, of, a lot of different databases. So they're portable and uh, they can exist both in the where clause as well as the, the predicate, or as, as well as in the, in the projection. Yes. So Types of geospatial data. Um, mainly, we are talking about uh, two types of typical geospatial data. One is the vector, and the other one is the raster. For vector, you can think of them as like point line polygon that represents, say, point of interest, a storefront, a restaurant, and things like that. Line string could be the road network, the pipelines running underneath on the, on the surface. Polygon could be any like administrative areas. Um, and all these um, types could be commingled into like multi-type, a collection. And most, uh, the most popular file format for the vector includes shape files, GeoJSON, WKT, KML, and BigQuery can kind of like handle all that input. For raster, mainly um, in the GIS world, we talk about like uh, satellite imageries. Basically, its uh, most popular one is the GeoTIFF format that just take a snapshot of the Earth and what's on the Earth. Um, we'll talk about a little bit more on the raster. So loading, say, vector data uh, to BigQuery, it's kind of straightforward because um, usually one shape file does not contain like billions of records and then uh, loading them like quite straightforward. There is no transformation whatsoever involved. So that's um, quite okay. But when we load the GOT raster imagery into the BigQuery, we need to go through a set of calculation. And the most compute intensive one we call polygonize the information. So here you can see in the image here, this is a GeoTIFF. GeoTIFF is kind of like um, multiple pixels, pixel by pixel, right? Say for example, for a ground representation of 15 meter also resolution, this GeoTIFF that covers one degree of the earth, one like light long degree, could be like thousands by thousands pixels in there and total will be like 10 million-ish. So each pixel that carries a value in the band. 
So if, for example, here, we, we, we can see there are like multiple pixels here. Each pixel has one value represent different things. For example, if we look at a flood risk uh, imagery data, this could be the, the uh, flood, the water depth for that location. And we need to polygonize that. And the way we polygonize that is like for any given pixel, we check its values. Basically, we look around, and see, hey, are you the same value as me? If you are, come close. We, we belong to the same polygon. And if you are not, I keep looking. If I exhausted all the pixel values around me, then I make a little polygon. And that polygon will be saved to BigQuery. So that procedure itself is very, very compute intensive. Just imagine, like, look around for millions of pixels. And that's where the challenge comes. So the, I, I got some questions around the polygonization. Mm -hmm. um, those polygons that it generates, are they, uh, are they all one value or are they, they similar values? Is it using like an edge finding algorithm or like how does it determine those regions that it, that it sets to polygonize? And, and does it generate like GeoJSON or well-known text or what, what's the output of the, poly, of the polygonizer? Very good questions. So first of all, the output for this polygonize um, it's GeoJSON. So basically in GeoJSON, you'll see a list of points that belong to the same polygon. For example, here, one, one pixel could be translated into one polygon. Mm -hmm. If there is no other pixel around it offers, carries the same value. Right, that, that would be the worst case. Like That's every pixel the in the TIFF image turning into a single polygon, but right. you've got like a thousand by thousand image, and then you've got a million lines exactly. of GeoJSON. Is that correct? That's right, that's okay. right. But it's a, it's a worst case, it's a rare case also, because a lot of cases, like say, if we look at the water depths uh, along a river, right? Maybe there are some like um, flat, surface on the on the bottom of the river mm -hmm. and then the depths could be the same so a lot of times you'll see um, various size polygons mm -hmm. and each polygon the value um, that we translate into that specific polygon is the same mm -hmm. yeah so as you can see from this um, slide, right, on the left is just a small segment of a GeoTIFF that we handle. And after we translate that into the polygon, as you can see, there are some like single pixel polygons just laying down there, right there, small ones. But there are a kind of like multi-pixel polygons there. So it all depends, depends on the value underneath. Did the did I answer the question? I did. Good, awesome. So um, let's talk about the ways we load the the data into the BigQuery. So basically, we explored two ways. One is the GeoBeam library. The other one is just old traditional GDAL. But underneath, it's all Beam data flow. So GeoBeam is a library that. Uh, um, created and maintained by Googlers. It's based on Beam, so everything run still uh, in Dataflow, and it um, handles some um, like big amount of the uh, shapefiles, uh, KML, GeoJSON, GeoTIFF very well. It offers like um, um, all the built-in capabilities to handle the shape files. It has the uh, transformations to do the polygonizing uh, of the GeoTIFF uh, built-in. Um, it is it works great al unless you run into some specific edge case like what we experienced. So I would say for GeoBeam, if you are like um, if you have medium, small to medium size file that need to be handled, GeoBeam is awesome. It offers um, great get started library, uh, some examples and tutorials for you to just quickly get started. Um, and uh, everything, uh, like the, the GitHub um, list here has everything, including how to build a customized container that downloaded all the dependencies um, for you. 
But once you hit a kind of like an edge case and you do want your data pipeline to handle everything seamlessly, you don't want to like throw that exception into some other bucket and handle it manually. So the way we handle that is another way, just use the data flow um, as a compute and run the GDAL command. Like as we, oh, I did it here. That's okay. So this GDAL is such a like old fashioned tool. Like everybody work in GIS world know the GDAL. It can do like tile, retile the rasters, like divide them, chunk them into smaller sizes, and then do the reproject, do the polygonizing. It's it's amazing tool. So a little bit uh, um, on the steps loading the shape file with GeoBeam. Uh, so basically GeoBeam just read the, the, the source files from the cloud storage and read them into the tuple and then translate them in, into the dictionary and then put them in the format that BigQuery will take and just like save them to BigQuery. For the load to geo, like loading the GeoTIFF with GDAL, we rely mainly on a few kind of like um, command lines. First, of, first one is the GDAL polygonize, polygonizer, and then we translate the output JSON into new line delimited, and then we use BQ load to load them. But all this happens uh, in the data flow worker nodes. In the data flow, we just put it in, in the flow and let it take care of, of it. Mm. Okay, so I, I think I, I, I understand uh, <laughs> what's uh, going on a little bit. And I'd, I'd, I'd read a little bit of the GeoBeam library and it's in Python, and it, but it uses some native code. But a lot of you know what it does, it uses Python data structure. So I, you could see that it might be um, you know, hitting the, the Python garbage collector or, or memory allocator a little hard. Whereas um, if, if we're, while it's 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 still using native code in Python a little bit, it's predominantly in native code when it's using GDAL. So uh, those two <laughs> commands like GDAL and JQ, using um, native code, you know C plus plus, and so it's a little bit more um, uh, you know uh, lightweight on on memory and and more um, efficient on compute when when running on the command line this way as opposed to running inside of python in inside of uh, the data flow worker very good point i'll just add on a little bit on what shang mentioned so if we we take when we use gdal to run the um, the procedure right um the, what data flow offers is a computer environment so with this data flow, just like we, we inside the, the we just use beam.map to call this this Python executable, right? So data flow will handle the complexity of scale um, to offer like using the customized container to do its job, and also all the logging, monitoring, and stuff. And we will let the GDAL handles the complexity of the geospatial part, right? How the file is being divided, being like translated. So we are taking care of the parallel, parallelism in, in both ways. First of all, data flows through Cloud Composer, we can arrange the parallel jobs. And then inside of the data flow, we could use the thread pool executor, right? To handle each sub file that needs to be like polygonized. So that way we have two layers of parallelism and that greatly improves the ingestion time, especially when like we have like thousands of files that need to be handled. Um, here is just, um, we provide a simple, simple reference architecture just to illustrate all the GCP component that involved for this kind of job. Basically cloud storage, we can think of like all the new data that coming in to the, uh, we, we just like shuffle them through cloud storage. And then when the new data come in, we could just kick off the data pipeline to start the processing. Once the data is processed, we can move the processed file into a separate folder, right? So next time when the data flow restart, somehow 
sometimes it hit error or something, it, we have to restart it. It has a very good restartability, right? Because all the files that left in the cloud storage bucket are the files that need to be handled. And then once the data landed into the BigQuery, we could do all kinds of post-processing, do all kinds of uh, transformation, joining, analysis. And that data in, in the um, uh, BigQuery will be served for you know, any dashboard, BI tools, API endpoints, et cetera, et cetera. Cloud Composer, it's very helpful when we need to scheduling like uh, um, at different time, uh, how do we chunk the batch of the files and logging uh, monitoring. It, it, it's always there for us to do the debugging, progress tracking and things like that. So Xiang and me, we, we discussed like what kind of data would be good to, to do, to demonstrate the idea of BigQuery geospatial analysis. And um, Xiang really into like this tree stuff. So we, we find <laughs> the New York tree census data. Um, as you can see, um, um, as you can, maybe I should present the cartel map. But that, that, that's okay. Um, so here, the little points underneath, like you see the green, green points, those are the census tree data for New York City. Um, we have about like uh, a little bit more than half a million trees in, in this data set. And then we got a New York City zip code as uh, administrative boundaries. We loaded them into the BigQuery and we calculated the New York City tree density. What this one does is it takes the ST function contains, right? We see, hey, how many count of trees contains in this specific zip boundary. And then we convert the zip code, the boundary into a square kilometer. And then we'll get a number, right? The tree count of square meter per zip code. And that's what we ended up. Um, like, for example, this area, that's where Google Office is, it has the most density, apparently. And we also loaded some sample cropland um, files uh, that's uh, exported from Google Earth Engine. Those are the, like, if you look at the background, the blue-ish image, that's the um, cropland. Xiang <laughs> was saying, oh, New York City has cropland. <laughs> <laughs> there's, so, a, there's apparently a lot of other data um, within that data set. So um, it's, it's used for a lot of other things for um, demarcating mm -hmm. what, uh, what land is used for. Yeah. So the idea here is like the BigQuery, you know, all this data is in the BigQuery. And we just illustrate this tiny little bit of the geographic area and tiny bit of, of the data points. If you have like terabytes, terabytes, petabytes, petabytes of the data that covers, you know, global, multi, uh, like different time, BigQuery can handle that just fine, just fine. So with that, um, I'll end the presentation. Um, we'll answer some questions. <laughs>